Hi, Bob. This is uh, Bob McBrayer, and I'm Bob Middleton, and we're going to record some history of your, your life in NASA. Okay. And first thing we always ask people is, uh, you know, wh where did you grow up? I grew up in Georgia. I uh, was born in Atlanta and moved out to a real small town called Temple, Georgia, about 40 miles west of Atlanta when I was five years old. And uh, grew up there with my worked with my father in a filling station in the garage until I went off to college. Mm -hmm. What college did you did you go to? Went to Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech. What, what degree did you get, Bob? A uh, mechanical engineering degree. Uh, it's a good, good, good degree. <laughs> mechanical engineers are always the cream of the crop. Uh, <laughs> we like to think so, don't we? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, when did, when did you uh, get out of Georgia Tech, Bob? I graduated uh, actually in the class of 63, but I got out in uh, 62. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as I got out of college, I had applied for work uh, with NASA at uh, Huntsville and at Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, by some mix-up in interviews, I managed to interview both of them. Mm -hmm. And I uh, didn't get an offer right away and went to work for Lockheed uh, Aircraft mm -hmm. in Marietta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And worked there for about a month and a half. And I got an offer from Houston mm -hmm. to come there and work. Um, and actually, I got a great higher offer from Houston than I did from Huntsville. Is that right? Yeah. Right. And so we moved to, we moved to uh, Houston in 63 mm -hmm. and stayed there <laughs> until... Uh, 1966, December 66, and then moved back to Huntsville. Transferred here. Yeah. Well, uh, I know that you were always uh, mo most of your career when I knew you, you know, was was in the, uh, the the human factors and other things like that. Uh, you want to tell us uh, uh, some how how that went? Very interesting how that uh, happened. Um, I had been working, uh, I'd done uh, actually some research work mm -hmm. in um, uh, protection of the hearing of the Apollo astronauts. Mm -hmm. And that was a very complex program where we were trying to determine if they were going to be able to hear when they got back yeah. after they'd gone through the Apollo launch. But after I finished that uh, research work, I moved into real hands-on fabrication, testing, providing flight hardware for the Apollo survival equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very interesting work. And then uh, it, it, it was uh, time for me to move closer to my family in Georgia. And so I started looking around for uh, some, uh, some work up here. And because I had a a background with working with flight crew members and uh, on the survival equipment, uh, then I was moved up here in human factors. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so if you're a human being, you always know about human factors, right? Uh, and that's when I first knew you yeah. there. And so I worked, uh, I had uh, some really interesting work. I, I worked on, uh, in fact, was in charge of the first uh, crew station review mm -hmm. for the uh, Skylab program mm -hmm. on the orbital workshop. And that was my first job when I arrived here. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, fascinating to me, uh, the size of the project and the uh, involvement of the crew with it was something that was really kind of new in the space program because they had a lot of room to move around and that was unusual for space flight at that time. Well, you remember also at that time there were some thoughts that maybe we might, might have some females going in there too. That's true. Uh, uh, That's true. That didn't come. That I didn't really encounter that until later in the program, uh, and I guess it was much downstream when we we're almost getting ready to fly. Well, I spent a lot of time working on uh, uh, the potty for the crew, mm -hmm. and uh, and and you're right. Uh, we had designed it for males, and sure enough, uh, we decided that it should have should have a place for females. Mm -hmm. And about this same time, uh, a program called Sortie Can was was being worked on, uh, and that was coming into into vogue. And we were doing some studies uh, on the concept verification test program uh, that were really precursors to space lab missions at the time. And uh, 
So I was really heavily involved in that, and uh, that led to uh, my work in the payload project office. Well, uh, after you went into the payload project office, uh, uh, did, did you stop working on human factors then, or what? Well, um, I didn't work on human factors so much. I had already begun to transition into crew operations kinds of mm -hmm. things. Okay. And uh, when I went over to the payload project office, I was immediately put into um, a group that worked on mission operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was heavily involved in training mm -hmm. and developing the training programs for uh, the crews, uh, pay, particularly the payload specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, if you recall, the uh, payload specialists were, uh, that was a new uh, flight crew member for Houston to work with, uh, and that was a, a member of the science community that was selected by the science community to fly on board the Space Lab payloads and uh, and operate the science. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time in the process, working out the process for how do we um, select and how do we hire payload specialists mm -hmm. to, to fly on uh, Space Lab payloads. Mm -hmm. well, how, how, what, uh, give us an example of what, what, uh, what were some of the, quest the uh, things that you were searching for. Well, uh, there was there was an awful lot of um, well, there was some resistance, in fact, to having somebody fly that was not a genuine certified astronaut, and so we had to be careful uh, in the legal sense mm -hmm. because there were lots of liability issues that had to be resolved, both from the standpoint of a payload specialist uh, breaking something or causing an accident or from the standpoint of an accident happens and you have a payload specialist on board that's harmed. Mm -hmm. So there were uh, enormous issues with, uh, with that sort of thing that had to be worked out and it had to be worked out with legal and it had to be worked out through procurement. So it was, uh, it was quite an interesting uh, event. Well, you're bringing up some points that uh, the public does, does, has never really seen, you know, uh, the, 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 the big uh, things behind the scenes relative to getting a crew member trained uh, to do a job like that. Well, and you're absolutely right. I don't think that the general public really appreciates um, how much time it takes for a crew member to prepare themselves to fly something like a Skylab mm -hmm. or a Space Lab payload. Mm -hmm. uh, the Space Lab payloads were very intense in their operations, and they were 24-7 operations. And, mm -hmm. Two shifts, and, and it was, uh, and it and it requires a, a lot of uh, investment of time by the crew members to be trained to do that, and that's time away from their families uh, most of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's it's something that I, I think people see the the uh, crew in the cockpit and think you know they don't think too much about what they had to do to get there. Well, not only what they had to do to get there, but uh, to make the time uh, in, in space much more productive. Oh, yes, absolutely. That, uh, that was the key to it, and uh, some of the missions that I was responsible for managing, uh, if, we, if we had not cross-trained the crew uh, to, take up, to be able to take up the slack when we ran behind schedule, mm -hmm. uh, we would have not been nearly so productive with our work. Well, the, of course, the, you, 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 you train the people, you know, for the basis, but there's always something that, that, uh, that you didn't really uh, expect happens up there. And, and that's, the, that's the real benefit of a very thorough training program is that you understand how to, how to completely how to do the nominal timeline. Mm -hmm. And so when things go off nominal, mm -hmm. You have a familiarity with uh, with the hardware and the processes and the procedures, so that they can react to that very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the training is is essential, um, uh, so that the crews are able to. Uh, if if somebody is tied up on a problem over here, that somebody else can take their task and get it done with uh, the same efficiency. Well, we've, so many times we've had to, in fact, I, I, I suspect there has never been a flight that, uh, that uh, went exactly as it was planned there. There were always uh, different little things, but 
being trained to do the basic job uh, enabled them to do other things. Absolutely, and and it it really demonstrated the value of having people in space mm -hmm. doing these jobs because they were able to react and and go in different directions uh, than we had originally intended with some of the science. Um, and it was just remarkable at, at how quickly they could change directions because of their training and their 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 own intellect and in background and experience and other things that they had done. One would suspect that uh, if we didn't do that, uh, there would have been, uh, been a hard job of writing a program for for a machine that would take over that job. Oh, it would have been uh, very difficult to do, very difficult, and still would be difficult to do. I think there's, uh, well, there's certainly a place for robotics and uh, in, in space, uh, the humans are the are the real key to successful research. I think in in large, particularly in large structures like space station or mm -hmm. space labs or or even Skylab. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, uh, you've talked about uh, this the the early parts of the thing. Now we've got a space station up there now. Uh, we're uh, expanding it uh, with this last mission. Uh, with uh, you know better uh, uh, power uh, on the station, uh, what's changed over time in in uh, training the astronauts like you were doing? Well, I I think that uh, in terms of training of the flight crews that are going to operate the hardware, I don't think a lot has changed because they have segments that they uh, go up for, and they're well trained on what they're supposed to do during that segment. I think that uh, the advent of computers uh, has greatly enhanced the capability of the crew to train themselves. Uh, used to, you had to go sit down with somebody and, uh, and learn about things, and now you can learn about things um, without having to sit down and talk to somebody all the time. Is there an example of that? I can't think of anything uh, that I've run across directly, but I, I, I know that since I, I really haven't had that much to do with the, the current space station, um, I was occupied with other things and I uh, didn't participate too much in the design and the operational structure of how that was to be done, and of course it was done out of Houston too. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I know that just based on my own experience with um, the advent of uh, computers and uh, in communication systems that it must be significantly different in that regard. Well, the, the, the let's say the, the expanded capabilities of computers to do things uh, has certainly enhanced the, uh, the space program. Uh, the, uh, you, you in, in your, you, you have a, a somewhat of a dual career. I mean, there, there was your time before you retired, and then and after you retired. Yes, and I, uh, I, I guess uh, the truth of the matter is, I never really retired. You know, when, uh, when you have your, when you've had such a wonderful career and you've mm -hmm. had such interesting jobs, mm -hmm. it's hard for your job not to be your hobby. Mm -hmm. And while I have other hobbies besides work, uh, work was always a favorite hobby. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I retired from NASA, I spent uh, about three years in the uh, in contractor community mm -hmm. doing different things. And uh, finally decided, well, I really just don't want to work like that full time. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I decided to do some consultant work. Mm -hmm. When something came along, it was really interesting to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, things come along that are really interesting to do. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm very engaged right now in some work that's very interesting. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. Um, the uh, McLeod Assembly Facility mm -hmm. down at Michoud mm -hmm. uh, has been since 1975 uh, the place where external tank was built and assembled and shipped out and it has been a facility dedicated to that with the prime uh, with the external tank prime contractor being having serving a dual role as the prime contractor doing the fabrication for the project and also run the facility and it is uh, decisions had been made have been made by NASA uh, 
to expand the role of MAF, uh, McLeod Assembly Facility, in uh, the Constellation program. Mm -hmm. So elements of Ares 1, Ares 5, Orion, uh, even the uh, RPK commercial uh, booster development to deliver payloads to orbit, a lot of that work is now to be done at uh, MAF. And so the challenge that I saw in this is putting together the management systems to convert MAF from a single program, single prime contractor uh, facility to a multi-program um, facility that needs a user independent contractor to be the facility operator. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's the big challenge. Well, you mentioned uh, the, the, the MAF facility down there. Tell us what MAF stands for. It's a McLeod Assembly Facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was used, um, in, actually the Building 103 at uh, McLeod Assembly Facility was built uh, to support World War II. Mm -hmm. And at the time was the biggest building under one roof in the world. 43 acres mm -hmm. under one roof. And um, after, after that time, uh, in 60, around 62, uh, Werner von Braun decided that that was the place where we needed to build Saturn V. Mm -hmm. And so it was, at that point, it was a multi-program multi, uh, uh, in the sense of different pieces of the booster and different primes were all in one, under one roof. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was used that way until, uh, until we finished with uh, Saturn V's, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then external tank moved in. And, of course, the, the access to the, to the water for transportation was a, a uh, yeah, part of it, too. Absolutely. The, the, uh, as part of the uh, uh, external tank program, the barge access was expanded at MAF mm -hmm. and to give it uh, an expanded capability. It also has a railhead. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not used that much anymore, but it has the capability that you can bring in box cars and you can put things, put ETs on uh, external tanks on barges and ship them over to the Cape. And so it has a, a tremendous capability. Uh, the thing that um, once once this transition from single program to multi program mm -hmm. is completed. Then there is uh, additional work to be done in developing because there's uh, there's a, a lot of acreage at uh, McLeod Assembly Facility that mm -hmm. is called green space that's mm -hmm. just not developed, mm -hmm. and it could be uh, developed into something like our research park up here mm -hmm. uh, to support uh, not only the work that's going on at MAF but university work. Uh, University of New Orleans uh, is very engaged in uh, math uh, activities. Mm -hmm. And so it can be in the state of Louisiana sees a real uh, benefit to the math facility uh, to support the New Orleans area and in fact that whole surrounding communities. Uh, so, so the development of math into something that it was not initially intended for is another challenge that uh, lies down the road are, are, are you still participating in those efforts? Yes, yes. I'm, uh, I've been uh, engaged in that since around the first of the year, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll go until I, uh, until I get some, uh, a few more management systems developed so that they, are, uh, they can go forward with their overall vision to develop MAF into something uh, that's really kind of a unique place, I think. Well, I can remember my time down there. That was always a wonderful place to go. Uh, uh, usually, uh, when I would go down there, it was 24-hour uh, uh, days uh, down there. <laughs> a lot of work goes on down there. And, uh, and of course, uh, the transition uh, to go to, uh, to accommodate the Constellation uh, pieces of the program. Mm -hmm. Uh, can certainly not interfere with, we still have external tanks to build. Mm -hmm. And so that's an ad additional challenge that's faced by the, uh, Sheila Cloud is the transition manager here at Marshall, mm -hmm. uh, director of transition office here. And, uh, and that's a, a real challenge that she's faced with uh, 
maintaining and not interfering with the, the current activities down there for external tank, and yet doing the, the uh, construction of facilities and uh, the work that's necessary so that uh, Ares 1, Ares 5, and Orion can go in there and, and uh, begin their fabrication in uh, not too distant future. Well, that little statement in not distant future, uh, what, what, you got any spe uh, uh, guesses on what that means? Well, no, not really. Uh, we're developing a schedule now for uh, when we have to uh, start uh, changing the facility around to accommodate when they want to start their, their actual uh, work in math. And so that is part of the management system that I'm working on is to try to get schedules in place so that uh, we have everything in its proper place. Uh, you can't go to work until you get the facility ready, and you can't get the facility ready until you build some things. And, and so you start backing up, and if we want to go to work uh, two years from now, we better get busy. <laughs> And, and, and the funding always uh, has a little bit of influence on that. Yes, and uh, because of the transition, um, the funding is different, and because it's different, anything that's different takes a little while to get changed mm -hmm. through the system. And so that is a, an additional challenge, I think. Well, the, the all of the future uh, uh, flying elements that you described there uh, are certainly seem to be you know the the next next Saturn V coming along uh, uh, they're doing it at a time where we could not do that with the Saturn V particularly with the the computers and the, the approaches to 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 analyze different things we had to do more testing at that time uh, you want to make a comment on that? Well, I don't think the, the testing part's ever going to go away. Uh, we still find, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was entertained by a report I heard the other day that the uh, Dreamliner that Boeing has built, the airplane, mm -hmm. uh, 787, I think, is the designator on it, that uh, they, this is probably the third airplane that they built pretty much in a computer. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, they still found uh, when they started putting things together that they had a mismatch between the nose cone and the uh, fuselage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's, there's never going to, uh, computers have certainly helped this a lot, but there's never going to be a time, particularly in the space program, where you cannot do uh, testing. I mean, you have to do testing. Mm -hmm. You just have to do it. Um, to make sure that things are going to fit together and they're going to work the way the computer says they're going to work. And there, there, is, uh, there is some really uh, extraordinary capability that the University of New Orleans, in cooperation with the Marshall uh, Materials uh, Lab, has developed. And a lot of it was used in uh, fabrication of the external tank. Uh, stir welding is one of them. And there's a lot of uh, capability in uh, in other areas that have been uh, research and development activities that for manufacturing operations that have reached fruition and are actually in use to build things. That uh, uh, So it's a direct output of research and development into the manufacturing world in the space program. I appreciate your comments on, on, on the, 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 the use of computers as well as the testing. And of course, as as we knew, when I was sitting over there in your seat from my recording, uh, I brought out the point that the Germans uh, really that was one of the elements that they brought to us was the need to to do testing uh, because you you, you it, it, there's always something that changes that wasn't supposed to be changed like that, and uh, I think that was the one certainly was for the Saturn program. Well, that was the, the main element that helped it. Well, I have always felt like the German uh, legacy was one of real systems engineering. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you say, testing, testing, testing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that impressed me so much with wor in working with design, uh, designs at the time that the Germans were, that I was here and the Germans were here, was the, the level of detail that they would penetrate to. There was no detail too small. That's right. 
and and I think we have lost uh, I think we've lost some of that discipline. Well, when you lose things sooner or later, you you it it, it hurts you. Yes, and and. Uh, and the other side of that is that when you lose things, uh, most of the time you can find them again. And I think that uh, one of the efforts that the center should really dig into is this whole concept of getting back to uh, just digging into the very last detail and looking at it to see what it does to you. Well, one of the reasons we're doing this uh, recording here is to, to let the people who come beyond us know our thoughts relative to, to this, uh, that, that what, what, what were the secrets of, of the success of the Saturn program, and I uh, appreciate your inputs on that. Well, I think it's, I think it's important for uh, people to realize that uh, Saturn did not was not our was not such a great success uh, just because we had a lot of money. It was a uh, and at the time we did have a lot of money, relatively speaking. But uh, it was a success because number one, people thought that every detail was important, mm -hmm. and there was a level of dedication to what we were doing that uh, I think is almost unparalleled in things of recent. Time other than wars. Well, it was a, a, a you mentioned the, the term war. Actually, it, it was a war level effort. It was. Time. It was, and uh, there were there were a lot of uh, a lot of people that worked to a fault. Mm -hmm. They worked too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the level of dedication was just incredible. Uh, people didn't know when. Five o'clock came, uh, unless they were done mm -hmm. <laughs> for the day. It was uh, it 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 been a very rich experience uh, to be associated with uh, the people in NASA uh, across the board. For uh, I was there 38 years, and I'm still meeting new people. Well, uh, I too was there, but I'm sitting here now, uh, still hoping to to contribute something uh, with these recordings. Uh, to the future. I, I think this is really uh, an excellent effort and uh, by archiving these things uh, people at least have the capability to go back and see how it was done uh, for and their own reference. And by people who did it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think video uh, is, is, is a very good medium to, to, to show people as opposed to text. Yes, uh, uh, books. So. A lot more comes across. Well, that's true. You can see emotions yes. there. Uh, well, what, what are what do you think? Uh, uh, you, you've touched on some of the things you know that uh, the mo moving to the future. What do you see in the future, Bob? Well, I I really believe that we'll go back to the moon, and I believe that uh, Marshall will provide the propulsion systems to get us there. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we will eventually go to Mars. And I think those are things that we, we must do. Mm -hmm. We must do. I, I think that people have zero appreciation for how much of the daily technological advances we enjoy mm -hmm. today that were driven out by the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. um, there are, there's so many examples of, uh, of things that we had to, we as a space program had to go develop in order to get it down to the size that we could use. Uh, you know, automatic blood pressure, pressure cuffs these days. Uh, a lot of that came from the need to know what the astronaut's blood pressure was mm -hmm. while they were sitting on the pad. Mm -hmm. And, and the astronaut couldn't take his blood pressure in the suit. And so uh, just simple things like that, uh, people don't appreciate or, and, and I don't know how you ever get the message out about things like that, but Velcro, I mean, every day you touch Velcro. And, yeah. and I tell you, uh, the space program was held together with Velcro. <laughs> it was unique. It was very unique. Right. Very unique. So there's just a lot of advances, and 
And I see the, these advances. Uh, I think there are things being developed now in the commercial world more uh, in terms of technology developments because they see the benefits that the, that the space program generated in technology uh, by the government's investment. And I think that uh, going forward with these missions to, to the back to the moon, it's going to open a whole new set of technologies that this country is going to need 20, 30 years from now. The, the ability to be in the front of the exploration efforts you know, always returns some, some rewards to you. It does, and, and they're not rewards that, you know, we, we, uh, I guess we've always been uh, kind of a country that says, uh, give me patience and give it to me right now. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that we are impatient with our technology and, and the benefits that we uh, reap from programs uh, that we have developed for space. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's probably not going to change. I think that's human nature. But as long as we keep going forward with the programs, the technology is going to keep rolling out. Well, we, we, we've discussed uh, the future, uh, uh, you know, uh, there. Uh, uh, what, 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 where, where would you like to, to, to leave some, some uh, 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 talk to the future people here? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I think that, that having, uh, having a good job, especially with the space program, mm -hmm. uh, and, and working with teams of people that you and I both enjoyed working with mm -hmm. is one of the things that you remember the most uh, later on in years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, people need to appreciate more uh, the teamwork that goes into doing anything and the people that are part of those teams. Well, I, I agree with you, Bob. Uh, there was a movie made recently, you know, uh, about the brothers in the World War II, and uh, I, I look on, uh, to some degree, the brothers in the in the um, uh, pro space program. Uh, it, it was a, a a war that we we fought, uh, uh, not with bullets, but uh, certainly lost a lot of people. With, with uh, uh, there were losses too. On yes. That. Yes. Uh, but I think it was dedication uh, to the thing. Uh, you're certainly still uh, working with that. Uh, what, what, what's your desire uh, for the future? For my own personal future? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I'm just thrilled to death to have opportunities to go in and help out with uh, work that is ongoing out the center. Uh, there will probably be less of that and more, uh, more time spent at home. Mm -hmm. More time spent at home. Uh, my wife and I travel a lot, and uh, I'll probably do more of that. Well, I understand NASA ha has an official program trying to support that. Uh, could you talk on that? Uh, trying to support uh, 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 people with with experience like oh. you. Well, I know that there that. Uh, well, you can. There are several ways that you can can work that uh, you can uh, you can come back as a consultant mm -hmm. uh, I know that they are trying now to get something through the system so that uh, as a retiree you can come back and work part-time oh is that right that's uh, I've seen that in the Federal Times that mm -hmm. uh, there's a program they're trying to develop to do that and I think that would be a huge benefit uh, part of the problem that we see right now is that, is that the generation that you and I are in mm -hmm. um, left and the generation that came behind us didn't have the experience base that we had. Mm -hmm. And and so you see a lot of folks like us that are going back out and helping with different things to try to impart some of that experience base back into the, the generation that's behind us. And I think that programs like part-time work with uh, allowing retired civil servants to come back to their agency with part-time work will be a huge benefit uh, financially as well as from a knowledge base to the 
uh, agency. That's a wonderful thought. Uh, those are certainly my thoughts, too. Uh, uh, I wonder if there's anyone that's, that's, uh, that's pushing that on the other side. I don't know. I don't know other than the article that I read in Federal Times. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how that's done. Although, uh, if you go out to the center now and look around, you'll see a lot of folks with gray hair out there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know that um, a lot of folks have been asked to come back and, and help out with mm -hmm. uh, different things. So it's, it's certainly a fact that's, it's a fact of life right now, but I think that the mechanisms to make it easier for that to happen uh, need to be pushed to get in place. Good. Well, in, uh, <clears throat> in closing, oh, you got anything uh, that you'd like to, to, to leave uh, here? Well, I, I think that having an opportunity to sit down and have a chat like this and have it recorded is, uh, is really, uh, I'm uh, very thankful to have an opportunity to do that. And I appreciate that that this does become a part of an archive mm -hmm. uh, that that people and I think it's a wonderful idea. I think you guys have just come up with a great idea. Here. Well, we wanted it to be more than just a historical thing. We wanted it to be a usable tool for the, for the future. And uh, in that context, should you uh, as you go on uh, find it something that you want to come back. Uh, we're always open to add, put an addendum on, on your recording. <laughs> well, I think that the only thing that I could say in closing is that working with um, the Skylab program and Space Lab payload program were, were really highlights of my career, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm pleased to have an opportunity to talk about those and uh, and the part that I, the small part that I played in them and. Uh, I'd be happy to come back if I have any other revelations. You, you've got you've got the, you've got the key to the door all, all, already. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you, Bob.